that this is really good because Corin did this because my first announcement was that Rob Wall held a workshop for the sound tech to be able to, anybody who wanted to come could come and find out what it was like to learn all about the sound, what involved, and uh, everything like that. So myself and Al Robinson joined Rob on Thursday. And I want to say that he is an excellent teacher. He started us off with uh, a, a book with papers, everything from the start to going over there. And one of the things Rob has done to make it easier for us and for anyone else that would like to uh, be part of that is he has set the groundwork so that what we do when we come in is he's already done it all. Basically what he's doing is just teaching us how to run the soundboard, but we just need to know this in case something goes wrong. But Rob has done an excellent job. I am so pleased to be able to be a part of the sound and I would encourage anybody who would like to join Rob and myself and Al in what we're doing. And also, if anybody's interested in media, which probably doesn't seem so intrusive, please just let one of us know that you would like to do the media. And uh, we'll certainly, Rob or somebody will set you up with that. But anyway, that was a great training session and I'm so happy to be a part of it. And um, just wanna let you know that uh, for those of you that are tithing, we have a basket in front. We also can tithe online uh, at the end of the service. Kyle would put it above the screen. And thank you so much for your hearts and giving. Um, it's a blessing to the Lord. We all know that. And uh, we just want to thank you. And as you can see, Jan has graciously opened up her coffee shop. So uh, for those of you who would like a cup of coffee and some cookies, by all means, join us at the end of the service. Be sure to stay six feet apart, though. Don't anybody look at each other. Okay, and wear your mask so that you can eat, which is really good, right? Lose some weight. <laughs> but uh, yes, it's a time of fellowship, distance fellowshipping. And we did. <laughs> so we just thank you for that. And um, you can, um, I think that was it. I think that's all that um, I've got to say this morning, but don't worry, I'll have more to say later. But in the meantime, we want to just open up in the time of worship and open our hearts to what the Lord has to say and to speak to us today. And thank you, worship team. Thank you. Oh, how about one? Oh, sorry, 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 Jan. <coughs> Karn, I forgot one thing. Uh, we are opening up our membership, like not our membership, but I'm starting a new directory. I'd like to start the, a church directory. And what I've done is I've put out in the, the uh, foyer some papers. These are used papers which means that all you have to do is put the information that you want about what you want in the directory. Your name, your birth date, um, anything, you know, like, so that way we can start the directory, which I'm excited because I'm going to be a part of that and I'm looking forward to getting to know each and every one of you personally. So again, there's, there's set in the foyer, please fill it out, just put it back in the basket and I'll pick it up and we'll start the directory. And for those that want to have their picture in there, just either email me a picture of yourself, or if you're not savvy about computers, I'll take a picture of you somewhere here, okay? And thank you again, and again, worship team, sorry for the interruption, but thank you. Thank you. Amen. Wouldn't you stand with me while we just open in prayer? Mm. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning, we thank you for the sunshine, and we thank you for the warmth, and we just feel like we feel your presence here this morning, and we ask that you just bless our worship this morning, have your hand over the word just so we can open our hearts, open our minds to what you have to say, and we're just excited to worship you this morning. Amen. <coughs> Time to you. 
sometimes it just comes on you and you can't do anything but fall on your face. You can't do anything but cry. You can't do anything but let the Spirit do whatever the Spirit wants to do. So that's what that was about for me. I didn't know as I walked up. As soon as I met, left that place and started walking towards the anointing here, I just fell on my face. So we do need, we do serve a God of miracles. And he's here every day in our lives, every day. It's not about this place. It's about recognizing his presence, that he is the God of miracles. So when we say that, just believe it in your heart. If you need a miracle, if, if you know someone that needs a miracle, we serve the God of miracles. Miracles, supernatural love, supernatural power. It's nothing that we can do. We just get to ask Him and step into it and believe. You know, the, the faith just say, Lord, just waken my faith, more faith. So I believe He wants to do something here today. In, 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 in every heart that's here, He wants to impart supernatural love. Um, so this week, um, I have a really dear friend, and in, in her prayer time with the Lord, he began to speak to her about um, the spirit of rejection. And so she said, she texted me the word and said, Laura, could you, could you read this word and let me know what you think? And as I began to read the word that she got from the Lord right away in my spirit, I felt the Holy Spirit say, I want you to share this on Sunday. I'm not sharing it for my glory. I'm not sharing it to be up here. I'm sharing it in obedience, and I'm sharing it because I really believe God wants to do something today. He's going to start something today. He may finish it in some people today. It may be a journey. So I just want to encourage you to open your hearts as I just read this word because I believe it's for every person here. I read it over myself a number of times already. So it said uh, this the spirit of rejection is bigger than many want to admit. But I'm breaking it off, so not me, but the Lord. But the Lord is breaking it off, all who desire freedom from its tyranny. It manifests in many ways, such as isolation, overachieving, depression, anxiety, anger outbursts, it seeks to repel love, which leads to isolation eventually, and it hopes for the death, for death to, to be its outcome. It needs to be eradicated and cast out by way of deliverance. It's the rejected ones I want, says the Lord. They will be accepted. They will be restored and made whole in my love, in that supernatural love that we just spoke about, that we just sang about. Uh, I am all they need. I am the father to the fatherless. My son paid for it all. I saw his form and rejected the sin that he took on from all those who've been rejected. He endured the ultimate rejection for the sin of the world and endured, endured it as my perfect sacrifice. And now anyone who accepts the sacrifice and believes that indeed my one and only son paid the price will be saved, healed, restored in my perfect love. It's all about his love. It's all about his love. Um, there must be forgiveness uh, from the rejected towards the one who rejected them, once delivered the rejectors, so the rejectors are, is, is that, are, are those demonic spirits, are, is that spirit of rejection. So once delivered, the rejectors may still try to reject and re-injure the ones that I've saved, but nothing can touch my redeemed who have truly accepted my invitation of love and accepted my son and become accepted in the beloved, which is my dwelling place. So if you need uh, that, if, you, if you're aware of that spirit of rejection, you know, we're going we're gonna to pray. And, and, so, and, and so what this, what this word is talking about is, is the enemy isn't going to leave you alone. He's still going to come back. The enemy wants you to believe that, oh, quote, it didn't work. Oh, it wasn't enough, that sort of thing. So when that happens, you have that authority to bind him and to shut him up and just to get into the word and just, and just and receive more of an of a, of a, of a outflowing and outpouring of the Lord's love. Um, 
They will, they will taste and see that I am good, and I will make my covenant known to them. And the scripture that my friend got was Psalm 25, 14, which said, The Lord confines, confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. So, Lord, Lord, Lord. So, I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. I just want to pray, however the Spirit's going to lead me. But if you, if that word speaks to you about the spirit of rejection, we always have a time of ministry at the end, right? And so if that's you, you know, come just tap on someone's shoulder and say, that's me. Can you pray for me? Um, and, and we're only too glad and too happy to um, and so I just want to pray for us now. I just want, so Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that we have all been rejected. And there is a, a deep root of rejection in all of us. And sometimes we just deal with the fruit that's manifesting. But you are calling us to chop off that root of rejection so that that fruit dies. And you have a beautiful planting in that place of our hearts and our spirits and our souls in our lives that is going to manifest fruit that we never believed or imagined possible as we chop off that root. And so, Heavenly Father, I just ask right now by the power of your spirit to begin a work in our hearts to begin a work in our hearts, Father. Open our hearts, open our souls, open our spirit to what, uh, to, the, to the reality of that root of rejection. And so, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I take authority over that root in all of our lives, that root of rejection in all of our lives. And I take your axe to it, Father, your anointed axe, Father. And I chop off that root in the name of Jesus, Father. I chop it off in the name of Jesus. And I command every fruit from that, from that tree, from that root to be dead now in Jesus' name. And Father, in this place, I thank you for your planting. I think if you're planting in every person's heart, you know exactly what they need. You know exactly what was meant to be there from the beginning of time. Be the gardener of their hearts, Father. Be the gardener of their planting, Lord. Lord, ask me to bless every person here. Pour out your blessing over them, Father. Lord, I thank you for them, your deep love for them, your call on their lives, what you're doing in their lives. You've begun a good work, and I thank you that you'll be faithful to complete it. In, in Jesus' name, amen. So the Lord's doing something quite amazing here. When... When the Lord brings such a strong prophetic word, there's often, there's often pain. There's, there's often, I don't even know how to explain it. Laura sent me the prophecy, was it yesterday or the day before? And, and I knew straight away, this is a word for us. Not just for this body, it's for the body of Christ. There's just so much rejection. Do you know that there's a huge battle taking place, my dear friends, for you? A huge battle. You've got yourself in the middle. You've got the Lord on one side and you've got the devil on the other side. And they're fighting for your soul. The Lord Jesus has already paid the price for you. The Lord Jesus sees you as a child of God. He sees you perfect. He accepts you. He loves you. He values you. He's got good things for you. The enemy wants to see you broken down. He wants to see you destroyed. The opposite of rejection is acceptance. The Lord accepts you. The enemy hates you. He rejects you. I was quite interested when I heard about some of the things you were saying, which is a spirit of rejection. 
Do you know anything that we do in ourselves is operating out of a spirit of rejection because we're trying to do it ourselves. We're not submitting it to God. And so my friends, Laura has prayed for us. But Laura, you said something and I immediately agreed with you. You asked something and I immediately agreed with you. You said we normally, we normally wait for prayers to be done at the end of the, the meeting. But what happens if we did that now? Why wait until the end of the service? It's not about going through the procedures and the process in order to do church. It's exactly what we're talking about. What does church look like? It's about allowing the Lord to touch you where you're sitting. It's allowing the Lord to be, as you're meeting with Dwayne, or, and I, I caught, caught his eye, for the Holy Spirit to touch you in that moment. That's what it is. It's about during the worship. Allowing the Holy Spirit to come on you and receive that healing. Receive that empowering. If there's anyone here that wants to be prayed over now, please come forward. Let's not wait. If you don't want to come forward, but you do need a touch of the Lord, just even from the now, as Laura was praying, just receive. Put yourself into a position, to a posture of just receiving that which God has got for you. Sometimes, like Laura said, it, it happens instantaneously in an instant. Sometimes it's a process. It takes a while. I'd love to walk alongside you, pray with you, talk with you, rejoice with you, cry with you. <laughs> That's what family does, you know. We love each other. So I'm not going to prolong it's not quite an appeal. It's just it's the reality of where the Lord is taking us at the moment. Thank you for having the sensitivity. Often when we do release what God has given us, it doesn't often look like a well-rehearsed <laughs> program. It's just real, though. I was with my wife on both occasions when she gave birth. It wasn't a neat, stereotypical performance. It was a little bit messy. But you know what happened? Something beautiful was produced. There was a birthing that took place. And so I believe there's a, there's a birthing taking place. Lord, we desperately need you. We desperately want you, Lord. So Father, I just pray, not a blanket prayer, because you don't do blanket things, Lord, but... An individual prayer blessing, Lord, over every single person that's, that's just connecting with you and you connecting with, Lord. Holy Spirit, just minister to every single person in a powerful and a real way. Do your wonderful thing, Lord. Holy Spirit, just do your wonderful thing now. Just break chains. Let people walk free. Let the captives be released, Lord. Yeah, amen. Amen. Thank you, Laura. Any comments? Any? Yeah, come up. <laughs> it's on. Okay. Is it on? Yep. Is it on? Okay. I can't hear it, but I guess it's projecting. I definitely have walked in the spirit of rejection. My parents... Uh, I'm 10 years, 11 years past my uh, brothers. And so I wasn't really wanted. My mom wanted to abort me. She actually investig investigated into that. But at the time, that wasn't legal. And the doctor said to her, um, it'll keep you young, you know. Um, so they had me. But there were still issues, obviously, because I wasn't fully embraced. I have a lot of memories of being all by myself. And as I got older, um, my mom told me, um, that she had the postpartum depression. So she wasn't emotionally available to me. She had a miscarriage after me as well. So she was in a period of probably mourning of loss. And so I kind of floundered. And, um, uh, but I know now I am accepted. And so whatever you've been through, 
because I, I truly believe we have the spirit of rejection either by our peers, by our bosses, even by churches. That has happened, and it's real. You need to mourn it. You need to grieve it. And then you need to let it go and forgive. Yeah. And um, I really feel that this is not only for us, but for the people that have recently left our church. And I want to pray a blessing over them. Because I don't know, I really don't know what happened. Uh, I feel their loss. I've been grieving their loss. And I miss them because they were good, dear friends. I haven't broken relationship with them. But I really feel uh, if I'm part of the rejection, I want to ask forgiveness. And I want to be the bridge that's part of the solution. And, of course, God can use anybody, you know, whether we're polished or not. So, Father, I just thank you that we are accepted and loved, even when we um, make mistakes whether it comes from a root of rejection from our childhood or a misinterpretation of communication, you are a loving father that can bridge every gap. You can restore every relationship. So I pray a blessing on those that may have left or may have um, been struggling in, in processing their own hurt and pain from whatever's happened or not happened, misinterpreted or not. Because, God, you are the God of miracles. And you can bring a bone that's broken and make it stronger back into the body. You knit it in even farther and deeper. And if people still are, are uh, wherever they're at, Father, we release them if they want to be released. But we also uh, grieve for that loss. And we desire for them to come back into the fold. If there's any of us that needs to go after the one, because Jesus went after one of the 99. He went after the one. So if there's a sheep that needs rescuing, if there's a sheep that I'm supposed to go after, Father, I pray each of us would know who that person is and that um, it's love, it's kindness that brings to repentance. So, Father, we just bless kindness, love, gentleness, um, that we would be understanding. We think about the residential schools and the rejection and all that happened there. We, we bless those people. We bless their grieving. We pray they grieve well. We pray we can come alongside, not understanding, but just come along and allow, allow the grieving, allow the anger, because they really have been hurt. And Father, we have no quick solutions. We pray for the bomb of Gilead over these things. Forgive us, Father, because we don't know what we do. We don't know what we say at times. So just, I just release that to do whatever it's supposed to do. And I pray for bravery for anybody in here to come for prayer afterwards or whenever it's appropriate and that they receive it um, in whatever form they can in Jesus' name.
Take two. Good morning, friends. Do you teach people, Rob, how to um, put on buttons? <laughs> Jeremy, where are you? Have, you? have you quickly stepped out there? I was just so blessed by what you did on the drums. Bless you. Um, Karen told me a little bit about the story, what happened at practice. Hope I'm not stealing your thunder, but... Um, the guys practice on, on Thursday evenings, and Jeremy normally plays the guitar or the bass, and when he plays the guitar, he's pretty cool. When he plays the bass, he's super, super cool. He just like, he just rocks away. He gets lost in space somewhere. But as he was worshiping, he said, and I hope I'm not getting the story wrong, but he said, I want to do something a little bit different. I'm just feeling a strong urge to get onto the drums and start playing the drums. I didn't know you play the drums, but... but <laughs> I just thought it was beautiful. Just thank you very much. I was blessed. The Lord is blessed. We were blessed. I've had a couple of waters already this morning. I'm a South African. I love hot weather. Maybe I'm an ex South African that used to love hot weather. I'm struggling with this heat. <laughs> So I'm going to be doing a lot of glugging this morning, not because, I, not because I'm needing to clear my throat because of the pollen and because of the, the Jason syndrome, you know, the tears and the Daryl syndrome, <laughs> but just because it's so hot. Last week, we, we chatted a little bit about what does the church look like with the COVID I don't know if, I don't know if we'll, we'll ever go back to what it used to be pre-COVID. And I don't think that's a bad thing, just by the way. But what does the church look like coming out of, arising out of the ashes? And so the question was asked, what do we expect going forward? And so we spoke about a couple of aspects. I believe that the Lord is so much more for the church than just jumping through hoops, from just coming to church on a Sunday in order to leave, to come back the next week in order to leave, in order to come back. It's more than that. It's about intimacy with the Lord. It's about, wow, it's about the Lord developing a relationship with us and us responding, responding to His touch. You know, God has got a deep desire for a relationship with mankind, and he still chooses to this day to release his love, his goodness. Surely he prayed about the goodness of God leading to repentance. But he still chooses to use the church to release that goodness in and through the church. For those of you that know me, you'll know by now that I just love family. I love my wife. I love my two sons. I love my daughter. I love Slade and Linda. And I now, Debbie, I believe you're also actually part of the family. There we go. And I love my mom and dad and, and my sister and the extended family, my in-laws. I love them. I love my family. But I love you guys. You're my family. And I love how God uses this model of family to describe the church. There's no family favorites in God's kingdom. I've been very cautious never to have a favorite. I used to say that Bonnie was my favorite daughter, and Carl used to be my favorite son. But now I can say he's my favorite natural son. I'm a wussy, hey? But God doesn't have favorites in his family. But he lavishly dispensed a huge array of gifts and talents to every single member. But God also called us to be an army. He often uses that, that picture. 
And as such, we have to have a, a squad mentality where we do things for the benefit, not of ourselves, but of the team, of the bigger purpose. We do things for the benefit of our great commander. And then we spoke briefly about our purpose is not just to come to know the Lord. That's wonderful. That really is. I love the fact that the Lord died for my sins, but he didn't just die that I can get into heaven. And so we spoke about what, what does it look like the other side of the cross? What is the purpose that Jesus came to earth for? Because that purpose he's given to us, the church, to to ensure that it continues. So the question which we're asking is, what did Jesus come to do? Why did Jesus come to earth? Last week I asked you to to jot down some points as to why Jesus came to earth and, and what is our purpose as the church. I loved school. I love school. School holidays. <laughs> that is it. I'm blessed that both my kids loved school. They loved most, I can say they loved every minute, maybe not every minute, but they, they loved it. I did not enjoy school. And homework was the least favorite thing of mine. So I'm not going to ask who did their homework or not. But what I will do, why don't we have for well, maybe 30 seconds, why don't you shout out some of some ideas that you may have had during the week? Now you guys are quite nervous. Corporate worship, okay, to worship, to worship who? Hmm. To worship Jesus, Linda? Thank you so much. Awesome. I'm going to ask for two more. Jan. Right. <coughs> Brilliant. Yep. Anyone have a last one? Absolutely valid. Okay, I've got two last ones. Last ones will be Jason and Daryl. You need some water. Yeah. Love you, bro. Love your heart. You've all stolen all my, all my points so far, which is good. Daryl? So, if I had to continue for another 40 minutes or 45 minutes, whatever the case may be, I'm sure that we still wouldn't have exhausted all the purposes of the, of the church. So, I'm going to start off today on speaking on, on five items. 
And I'll conclude the series with, with the remaining six. I'll, I'll read them out to you, what I'm going to be speaking about today. I want to speak about exalting God. I want to speak about enjoying God. I want to speak about advancing and establishing His kingdom. I want to speak about enthroning Him as King. And the last point, if we get there, is to exemplify Christ. Let's fly right, right in. The first point is to exalt God. Psalm 34 verses 1 to 3 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will be on our lips. Psalm 118, 28 says, Thou art my God, and I will give thee thanks. My God, I will exalt thee. Give thanks unto Jehovah, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. There's so many more scriptures. I'm going to read one more, I think. John 12, verse 28 says, Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Do you know what happens as we exalt God? There, bring, there comes about a unity. There comes about a blessing, which is from unity, but it's in glorifying God. There's a unity that comes as we collectively come together and glorify God. There was a, Shirley made reference earlier on to, as she was praying, to having unity with one another. I totally agree with that. I believe in unity. I believe that there should always be. The Bible says, do your best <laughs> to do what? To live in peace with one another. There is that, I'm going to use a word, a strong word, there's this obligation. But you know what? It's not primarily for our benefit. We will get benefit out of it, but it's primarily to worship God. It's, it's so that He can be exalted, so that God can be glorified in our, in our relationships and our friendships. Just as Christ accepts me, and as Christ accepts you, we accept each other. God gets glory in that. God commands life and blessing where there is unity. We know that. Psalm 133 makes it very clear. If part of my blessing is dependent on unity, because that's really what the Scripture is saying, then I will exalt God, my dear friends, and I'll work at my relationship with others. Can I say that again? If my blessing is dependent on unity, then I'm going to exalt God, because that's the easy part. But I'm going to work on my relationship with others as well. The second point is, it sounds crazy to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. As I often chat with people and I just find out what is their perspective of church and how are they with the Lord and how are they just in their, in their days? Do you need prayer, my brother? You're back all right? Just bless my brother, Lord, even now as we speak. Just bless him, touch him. Release your healing just to flow right through him now in your name, Lord. Amen. I've come to understand, though, that not everybody has got this amazing view of Jesus. Not everybody has got this view of, of God and the Holy Spirit that is a pleasing view. Many people just don't enjoy God. They see God as this austere person, this serious face all the time, just just wanting to shout at you. 
wanting to, waiting for you to make a mistake, and he's going to whack you. That's not the experience that I have with God at all. I honestly believe, my precious friends, that we are called to enjoy God. I've got two kids, beautiful kids, actually three. I don't desire that my kids love me because they have to. I desire that they love me and they value me and they appreciate me because of our relationship, because of our friendship. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is, is good. Taste and see. God is to be endured, enjoyed, not endured. You don't have to patiently wait it out to see, did I get through this hour of church? Did I come out unscathed? <laughs> I say that tongue-in-cheek because I did not have a good relationship with my headmaster at school. He knew me well. He knew me by name. But I did not enjoy when the teacher kicked me out of class yet again, go to the headmaster's office, I did not enjoy his presence. And he probably did not enjoy my presence at all. And I couldn't wait to get out of his office. In those days, you normally would, they believed in caning, so you'd get either one shot or two shots, or the maximum was six. I had six on several occasions. And I was doing nothing. I was just sitting there. Yeah, right. So on 37 verse 4, says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will grant you the desires of your heart. I love that verse. You know what the desires of my heart are? What your desires of your heart are? Those are your dreams. Those are the things that you just, you're really speaking to the Lord about. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight I honestly believe that the Lord created everything before he created man. Do you know why? So that we could enjoy it. To enjoy his blessings. Our lives and our lips, our actions and our attitudes should show people that we're enjoying our God even when we're going through difficult times, even when life is not that easy, even when we have to offer a sacrifice of praise. I enjoy God. The third point is to advance and establish his kingdom. I wonder what that means. Matthew 6, verse 10, your kingdom come. You see, the message we preach is about the gospel of the kingdom. It's not the message of what our personal mandate is or what our church mandate is or what our vision is. The message we, we proclaim, the gospel we proclaim, is the message of God. It's the message of the gospel. Matthew 4, verse 23, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Oh, yeah, and other things, such as healing every disease and sickness amongst the people. Matthew 9, verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their, signal, in, their, in their signals, in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Oh, yeah. And healing every disease and sickness. Matthew 24, verse 12 and 14, is a sad text. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow, will grow cold. 
But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. My friends, the church is the agency through which the kingdom comes to earth. Many people have made the church the kingdom. Many people have said that, that it's all about the church. That is the big thing. It's not about the church, my dear friends. It's the church is, is a vehicle that the Lord has used to affect his kingdom. The kingdom is so much better than the, so much better and bigger than the church. Through the church, I want you to remind us all who the church is. It's you, it's me, it's us together. That's who the church is. We aren't the kingdom. But God is going to use you and me to affect his kingdom. The kingdom should and will flow. And it should permeate into various sectors of society, the media, finance, politics, sports, art, science, entertainment. I believe that we should impact every single sphere of society. This is pulling heaven down to earth. This, I believe, is what it means to advance and establish his kingdom. It's a kingdom where there's righteousness, where there's justice, where there's mercy, where there's compassion, where there's love as Laura was speaking about, where there's acceptance. Where those that are in chains get released, where the captives are set free, my dear friends. And my encouragement to every single one of you that calls yourself a believer is that wherever you are, the kingdom should be. You should bring the kingdom there. And I encourage you, like we said last week, let's show, tell, shout, Demonstrate the kingdom. My second last point, well, is to enthrone him as king. Psalm 102, verses 12 and 15 says, But you, O Lord, sit enthroned forever. What's a king? What's a kingdom? What do you need for a kingdom? I guess you need a king and you need subjects. I can't be a, a kingdom unto myself because I don't have subjects, nor am I a king. Jesus is that king. He is my master. He's our master. He's our leader. He is the supreme being of everything. But he needs subjects. So we are like his subjects, I guess, but we're his sons and his daughters. We obey and respond to Christ out of relationship out of honor, out of respect and love. We don't obey out of law because we have to. Luke 6 verse 46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It's a very interesting perspective there. You see, the Lord is really saying there, you call me Lord, you acknowledge me as your king, but you don't follow my commandments. There's a sad indictment to those mentioned in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of, of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In Colossians chapter 1, and verse 18, talks about who the head of the church is? Who's the head of the body? He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, 
so that in everything, not in some things, in everything, he may have supremacy. My, encourage, my encouragement to you this morning <coughs> is that with, we are part of a body. It is not about ourselves. We are part of his body where Jesus is the head. And again, I'm encouraged that God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The last point I want to bring this morning is to exemplify Christ. Exemplify is just another word for being a good example to other people. We are called to be a good example of who Christ is. In Ephesians 1 and verse 14, it says, the scripture says, we read, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You know, it's quite an important consideration. I want you to mull over it for a while. I believe that God is more concerned with what the church is than what the church does. Think about that for a moment. I'm not for a moment suggesting that there shouldn't be any works. I'm so looking forward to, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit later on, but Jeremy Bachman will be, will be preaching next week about some of those works, some of those, those actions. And there's a huge, and I totally agree with that, faith without works is dead, and without works it's impossible to please God. But you know what? The Lord is more concerned with who we are than what, what, with what we are doing. There's such a, a performance mindset in many people that they try and work and work and work, and they try and prove how, how good they are. Or they proved to be accepted. The Holy Spirit reminded us again this morning that we don't have to be bound up. We don't have to have a spirit of rejection. We don't have to perform. Do you know who you are, my dear friends? You are a child or a daughter, you're a son or a daughter of Jesus. I've got two natural kids, they don't have to work hard to, be, to have my DNA. No matter what happens, they've got my DNA. It's as good as it gets, Carl, Siobhan. <laughs> You're stuck with me. And your mom. He has made us new creations I am a child of God. You are a child of God. I wish we could understand our identity in Christ. Our perspective on life will change. Our relationship with Jesus will change. For he chose us and him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. It's not that hard to be an example to the world of Jesus. You know what we're doing? We're reflecting who he is. We're just doing what he did. Jesus came to show us what to do. He came to show us what his father is like. John 14, 8 and 10, Philip says, Lord, show us the father. And that will be enough for us. Jesus answers, it, answers Philip and says, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been, you, been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The word I say to you, and not just my own, Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. 
every single thing that Jesus did. There was not, nothing except, there's no exception to that. Every single thing that he did, he was reflecting that of the Father. <coughs> this is what God is like. I spoke a couple of months ago about lies we believe. Many of us died that lie. I believe that Jesus was the, was the, the one full of mercy. And I believe that God was there, righteous, holy. But make a mistake, Steve, I'm going to whack you. <coughs> and I should say to myself, thank goodness I'm covered with the blood of Jesus that the Father doesn't whack me to death. That's what I used to think, my dear friends. That's just such bad self <laughs> I was going to say self-awareness, but it's a lot more than that. It's just such a bad perspective, such a bad identity. I've now come to understand that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit will do everything possible for me to succeed and for you to succeed. He loves you. He cherishes you. God gave His own Son. This, this big God that wanted to kill me, He gave His own Son that I could have unity with God, could have a relationship with Him. Now, I understand, I'm not, my views haven't changed about God not being able to tolerate sin, not, having be able, not even able to be in the presence of sin. I get that. I know what Jesus has done on the cross. But you see, I've gone a step further, and it just wasn't true. When Jesus healed lepers, when Jesus healed, the, when, when Jesus fed the multitudes, when he, when he cast demons out of people, it wasn't just Jesus and his own entity doing that. It was Jesus, it was the Father, it was the Holy Spirit doing it. When we walk in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus, we would do what he did. And according to the Father, the Lord says that we would do greater things than what he did. And so I believe that the church needs to embrace the power of of the resurrection. And so that is how we'll advance the kingdom. I want to read something verbatim today from something which I got off the, the Alliance, the Christian Missionary Alliance website, just about what our beliefs are. I found it quite, quite a blessing, actually. Because it really does capture, it really captures my heart in a huge way. But it talks about, and for those of you, I'm sorry, I'm still a new boy in the CMA. I've only been here for three years. So I'm still learning many things. And I know this already. I've read it several times. But I want to bless those of you that may not have read it or may not have heard about it. We talk about our, our belief structure, what we believe we believe that we are Christ-centered. <coughs> Christ is as our Savior, sanctifier, healer, and coming King. Establish the alliance theological ground rules that are set for a movement of God. We proclaim with a new boldness, a, new, a full gospel, centered on the power, person, and presence of Jesus Christ. We believe in the total sufficiency of Christ to fulfill all God's expectations for every believer. Christ must be exalted above all else. Christ must be exalted above all else. Above the church, above the rules, above regulations, above mindsets, above paradigms, above principalities and powers, Christ is exalted, my dear friends. Spirits empowered. Our ministry effectiveness is in direct relationship to the Spirit's control over our lives. The deeper life recognizes the indwelling Christ transforming our lives through the Holy Spirit by substituting ourselves with His strength, His holiness, His joy, His love, His faith, and His power. Out of sanctification emerges deeper worship, richer fellowship, fuller equipping and nurture and training, a more effective evangelism and power 
in missions. <coughs> I remember saying last week that not out of works, but out of relationship. As you start developing a stronger relationship, and when I say a stronger, maybe a more mature relationship with Jesus, you know what starts happening? You suddenly start realizing what a holy God we serve, what a righteous God we serve, what a just God we serve, what a God full of compassion, what a merciful God. But you know what you also start seeing, and that's what I, that is a stark contrast. You start realizing how much bad stuff, I mean, I don't even know what to say, how bad the enemy is, how terrible sin is, how wicked the enemy is. There's a strong contrast. It's not just a neutral, numb zone. It's a stark contrast. It is a, a polar opposite. And I honestly believe I'm not becoming more self-righteous. I don't want you to hear that. I'm not, saying, I'm not even suggesting that. I'm just saying out of relationship. I've been married to my wife for many years. 26. Okay. Whew. <laughs> 26 years. The longer I know my wife, the better I know her. The more I understand the little idiosyncrasies that I didn't quite understand before. I start coming to grips with them. I knew them initially. And as I start experiencing life and start understanding, I'm realizing that I can't, I can't do certain things like forgetting how long you've been married for. But I started understanding what it is that drives you, what you like. I started understanding things which, which you hate. And so I don't cross that line because it's not a good place to be. Happy wife? Happy life. The last point on the belief system of the CMA, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, was mission-focused. Out of a Christ-centered and spirit-empowered environment will emerge an unquenchable passion to be on mission with God. We have been blessed to be a, a blessing to the nations. Mission is not the activity of the church. It's the identity of the church. It's quite an interesting concept. I thought long and hard about that. And I think mission is an activity, but we should rather be known as being, this is what we do. This is who we are. I spoke earlier on about our identity. It's not based on, on what we are doing. It's on who we are. The same thing as the, as the Alliance Church. We shouldn't be known as we the guys that do all of those missions down the, the West Coast, etc. That's wonderful that we're doing that. But you know what we should be doing? Our identity, who we are, that's why we're doing it. It's just obvious. And then the vision prayer. I'm going to leave you with a two-liner. Oh God, with all our hearts, we long for you. Come transform us to be Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, mission-focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere. Short, sweet, to the point, and wow, so powerful, man. <laughs> so powerful. I'm going to leave it over there for today. Um, I will be speaking about six more points, mostly on what you've, that you shouted out earlier on, saving the best till last, maybe. <laughs> They're all good. So next week, I, I made a comment. I'm going to be away with, with my wife and my kids, all of my kids, actually. And the Slade and Linda, we're going for a couple of days on the boat, not on a mission trip, although if I know Slade, we'll probably stop off in one of the areas um, and just, just say hi to some friends. But we're going to be away for about 11 days, I believe. I'll be missing one Sunday, July the 4th. And Jeremy Bachman, one of our elders, will be speaking on following Sunday. So Jeremy is going to be speaking, unless the Holy Spirit changes, which you might, Jeremy, but he'll be speaking on the gospel demands a response. 
If we receive the word and it takes root, it must and will evidence itself in our actions. God is raising up an army of saints, and there's no room in the kingdom for spectators. We all need to step into our positions. Well, that's fighting talk. That's squad mentality. That is saying that there's a time where you can sit on the pews as a spectator because you're recovering, because you're building up again, and that's cool. But ultimately, our job is to get out there and do what he wants us to do. Do what he's instructed us to do. So Jeremy, may God bless you. Next week, as you just release the heart of the Father, the heart of Jesus, may God bless you. Friends, thank you for your patience this morning. Thank you for just listening to what the Lord is doing. I'm going to call on, on Debbie Willerman um, just to come and round off, round off the service. Bless you. Looking forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. God bless. Thank you. What an awesome, awesome service this was today. It's incredible. Steve, I just want to thank you so much for being the committed man that God has made you to be. Faithful, always here, except for two weeks from now. <laughs> but uh, incredible word. The Lord has spoken through Laura. The Lord has spoken through Shirley. The Lord has just spoken today. And he's actually speaking to every one of us here today, even though we ourselves have not really gotten up, and the Lord may have not given us the courage to do so. But it does take a courage, and the Lord is really uh, gracious. And um, we are going to um, end off our commitment with the Lord today in a song. But one of the songs that the worship team was the one about miracles. I mean, who wants a miracle? I do. Who needs a miracle? I do. Have I seen God working his life in my life? He has. God's miracles are not something that we physically see. It's just something that we feel. And we have to know that because that's the way God works. He works within us. And there, there are times that we do need to let go of all of those things that are within us. There is anybody today, even myself, who just needs, needs a touch from the Lord. You need somebody to pray for you. You need that commitment in your life that he is what he says he is. I just say, pray that you would come forward. Speak with anyone. Have somebody just pray for you. Pray for me. <laughs> pray for all of us. And I'm just going to end it off with a, a blessing from the Lord. This is my prayer to each and every one of you and to myself. And it's one of the songs that was sung today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, just bless each and every one of us here today, Lord touch those that need a touch not only here but those that are online father that are maybe all alone lord just give them that your touch lord touch them father we just ask this now in your precious name amen
Jen has got some wonderful coffee and tea and biscuits out there. So when you're done praying, please go and join her. <laughs>